Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce, and today is Tuesday. So it is our next installment of the Octurian Anthology, which was channeled by Tom Kenyon from the Octurians. Now, if this is your first time here on the channel, welcome. So glad that you are here. You can find all of our past episodes going through this channeling down in the playlist called Called understanding the Magdalene. Now I will be placing that down in the description box below so that you have an easy way to locate this this work. And in this playlist you're also going to find some other channelings from Tom Kenyon like the Hathor material as well as the Magdalene manuscript. The Magdalene manuscript was the one that we started with with Tom Kenyon. In this playlist you'll also find the Sophia Code as well as the book Return of the Divine. Sophia. Possibly not necessary to watch prior episodes up to this point, but if you feel like that is necessary, if you start listening and you feel like you need some back references, again, all of that is in the playlist, Understanding the Magdalene, which once again will be down in the description box below. So, of course, within this channeling, we've got a few Octarians that Tom Kenyon is speaking to or that he is channeling. I want to remind everybody that when it comes to channeling, like most things in life, you do need to take everything with a grain of salt. The main reason why I say this is because Tom Kenyon, as the channeler, with all channelers, not just Tom Kenyon, is they're relaying this information through the lenses of their own perspective, right? We know that there is no such thing as reality. It's all perspective. And even if you go to a tarot card reader, you're, the tarot card reader is going to be reading the cards through the lens of their own reality and their own perspective. It's, it's not something people do intentionally. It's really literally the only way we know how to communicate is through the lens of our own reality. So with that being said, there are some things that I agree with in these uh, manuscripts. Actually, most of it I agree with, but there are a few things that I, I don't agree with. Um, we, we found a lot of that with the Magdalene manuscript. For example, we know that Yeshua was never crucified. Um, and in and, and, and the Magdalene manuscript, there is sections about the crucifixion. But of course, at that point, Tom Kenyon, when he was channeling this information, the whole world believed that Yahshua was crucified. There was no information to counter that claim. Only recently has stuff come out or been disclosed to prove the truth that he was never crucified. And so we have to understand that there is a perceived sense of reality. Same with geography with a lot of these these um these channelings. We've run into that with the, you know, the idea of where Egypt is. And you know, five years ago, less than five years ago, maybe even like two years ago, I would have believed that Egypt was the place that in Africa that we've been taught it is. But now so much has come out, so much information has come out with the Tartarian stuff to prove that where we call Egypt isn't actually Egypt. Egypt is actually the, the actual Egypt spoken about in the Emerald Tablets in all the missing books of the Bible is actually the southeastern part of the United States. And if that is new information for you, if this is your first time hearing, your first time hearing that, surprise, <laughs> yay, surprise, I don't know. Not really going to get into that on this episode, but there are a lot of incredible channels out there that dedicate their whole channel to researching our true geography, um, our true you know, the Israel, the, what they call Israel is actually here in the United States. It's not over in the Middle East. Um, Canada is the real France. There's so much. This is not just something that I'm pulling out of my ass. There is so much information out there that proves what we've been taught, where we've been taught these locations existed are not where they actually existed. And so I would encourage you, if this is your first time hearing this or not your first time hearing this, I would always encourage you to go out there and start that journey for yourself, finding this inf information out for yourself. I did get a question on one of the videos about how do we find the information that Yeshua was never crucified. Um, missing books of the Bible. That's the main um, main source of information is the missing books of the Bible. That is why they banned most. So there, there's supposed to be 777 books in the collective Bible. We only have 66 of those books, and those 66 books were fabricated by King James. So we don't even really have access to the full 
full transcripts of the teachings of Yeshua and Magdalene, because Magdalene was his co-teacher. She was also the Christ. She was the Visica Pisces, which people use as the fish emblem. Today, it's actually the Visica Pisces, which was the original emblem of Christianity. It was not the cross. It was the Visica Pisces, because Magdalene herself was the main teacher. Yeshua was her husband, her Messiah. Messiah means phallical pillar. So no, Yeshua is not your Messiah. He is Magdalene's Messiah. Phallical pillar means a penis. He was her husband. All right. So we have to start to really untangle this web. I get people asking me all the time, like, how do I talk to my friends and family about the Bible being fabricated or um, Christianity not being what we think it is? And I always say, don't start with the big stuff. Don't start with the whole Jesus means hail Satan and the real name was Yahshua and he was never crucified. Don't start with that right? They're going to push back. They've been so heavily brainwashed into this destructive death cult, um, which Christianity is a destructive death cult. Um, Start with maybe asking them, like, isn't it interesting that the Bible is the word of God, but yet there's a copyright on it? Maybe you should look and see who owns the copyright of the Bible. Start there. Because that's when it's going to start. You're you're obviously going to have people have cognitive dissonance with some of this stuff for a while. That's okay. We all go through that. But just start planting those seeds with the little things. You know, why does the Windsor family have a copyright on the Bible? And why do all these other religious texts, like the Vedic text, Bhagavad Gita, that we're taught as satanic, those don't have copyrights on them. But yet the Bible does. Interesting. Kind of interesting, right? Or have you noticed that a lot of these characters in the Bible are doing human sacrifice? Have you noticed that? Like, that's kind of weird, right? Like, or that they have like a ton of wives. It's not like these wives wanted to be their wives. This is, you know, this is trafficking. But yet these are men of God. Interesting. Kind of weird. Like, shit's not adding up, right? And then you can start to say things like, hey, you know, in some of these missing books of the Old Testament, um, it says very clearly, like very clearly, that Yahweh is Moloch. And Moloch is the god of child sacrifice. It's a little strange, no? We maybe start like, or like in the missing books of the Old Testament, Jehovah is also a name for a demon one of the high-ranking demons under Lucifer. So maybe just kind of start pointing that stuff out. And then over time, when people, when it starts to unravel, then people will be ready for like the big thing, like the big things. Like, yeah, his name wasn't Jesus. Jesus means hell Satan. The J sound didn't exist back then. His name was actually Yahshua bin Yosef. He was not Jewish, he was Egyptian, as was his wife Magdalene. They were the Essenes, which is the priest and priestess of Isis. Um, Isis was spelled E S S E back then, the Essenes. And they were never, he was never crucified. And, you know, how amazing is that? That's, that's actually really good news. Like, that's the good news is that he was not crucified because the God that I believe in, the God that I pray to, the God that I feel a connection to would never ask for a human sacrifice, right? In fact, the God that I believe in would never want people doing that to each other or to the animals. And so isn't it interesting that these satanic practices involve these rituals, but yet those rituals are being done in the New Testament and being reenacted in churches every Sunday and communion ain't nothing but cannibalism. You know, then you can start coming in with the heavy stuff, you know, but it's going to take a time. I, I would also suggest, um, suggest we talk a lot about cults on this channel. I would absolutely suggest if you are really concerned about some of your family members that are heavily indoctrinated into the Christian faith, regardless of whether that's Protestant or Catholicism, doesn't matter. It's all coming from the same same source. I would heavily suggest studying cults and deprogramming. The one thing you're going to find, like I can talk openly with you guys because you guys are ready to hear it. But the one thing you're going to find when you're coming up against somebody who has heavily been indoctrinated into a cult, whether that's 
Scientology, whether that's Nexium, whether that's um, Heaven's Gate, Branch Davidians, or the Christian Church, doesn't matter, is that if you start to come in heavy and hard with bashing the belief system, they're going to double down. All right. So the first thing, so like in my real life, like off of YouTube, again, I come hard on YouTube because you guys are ready to hear it. And this is what my channel is for. Right. But in my real life, outside of, of YouTube, I would never just walk into a church and be like, you guys are worshiping Satan. No, I would never do that. Um, I would handle it with care and understand that these people We've all been there. We've all been brainwashed in some some way or another, whether that's through religion, whether that's through academia, whether that's through science or medicine. It doesn't matter. There are cults everywhere. It becomes the, this belief system that is indoctrinated into you becomes a part of your visceral reality. And so when you come in strong and you try to rip that from somebody, their whole world starts to crumble and they're going to hold on to that belief system even stronger because it's a survival tactic. And so you need to come at them with humanity, with love, with compassion, with understanding and slowly let them start to ask you questions just say like saying like oh did you know the bible has a copyright like that's harmless that's a harmless thing to say to somebody it's not harmless in the in the in the fact that it's them telling you it's the controllers telling you that the bible isn't the word of god they have to tell you the truth and that's how they tell you the truth is showing you that there's a copyright on the bible which means it was invented by someone but as far as like the belief system, when you point out there's a copyright on the Bible, you're not actually challenging the belief system at that moment. And so you can start with that. You could start with that and then let them ponder that for a while. Plant the seeds, let them start to ponder that, plant it in their head, back of their head. So it's kind of there. Then maybe you can start to talk about Mithraism. Like, isn't it fascinating? that the Jesus story is identical to the Mithra story. Isn't that fascinating? Let that start to untangle. Then when they come to you, and nine times out of ten, once that stuff starts to untangle in somebody's mind, they will start doing the research on their own without even asking you. They might not even come to you until after they've started doing their own research. They might just sit in their, at their house one day thinking, God, this is kind of weird, and then just start Googling shit, you know? And so let them kind of be the leaders of their own awakening. Let them be the person to kind of wake themselves up. And then if they do come to you with questions, then you can calmly sit down there and talk to them. And I, I've told you guys before that... Um, with the Jesus thing, like Jesus meaning hell Satan is to me a lot less potent than telling someone he was never crucified. The crucifixion is like the crux of the Christian faith. And so that my when I first realized that Yahshua was never crucified, again, I was liberated. I thought I just started laughing. I was like, of course he wasn't. How could I have ever believed that he was? Of course he wasn't. Because to crucify a human is a satanic sacrifice. And the real God, the real consciousness, does not ever demand that of his creation. To sacrifice something is a religion of death. To let something live is a religion of life. And life is from the real source God. Death is Lucifer's game. So it all made sense to me. But the minute I found out that Yeshua was never crucified, it had been years in the making of me researching the missing books of the Bible, of me understanding the Eastern text from my times in India, learning Sanskrit, going through all the Sanskrit of the Vedics. You know, there, there's, there was, it was a long time coming for me to be like, no shit, of course, LOL. Wow, of course, that's such good news. Like, amazing news that he was never crucified but for somebody who doesn't have that backing for somebody that's just been taught that they're loved so much by god that god god sacrificed his own son that's a heavy pill to swallow and so if they if you do get into that conversation i would just encourage you to remind the person you're talking to 
that they don't have to sacrifice anything to receive God's love, that they were born with God's love. That is not something you have to gain. It's something you just already have. And how amazing is it? How amazing is it that we get to be in a faith, in a spiritual consciousness, where we don't have to sacrifice anything to understand the love of God? And just remind them of that, right? That there's no bargaining for your soul. You own your soul. It is your work to figure that out, though, and to figure out that you're already, your soul's already complete. And that all sin means is to miss the mark. That's all the word sin means, is to not understand who you are. And so I would highly suggest coming at your friends from that perspective versus like coming at them aggressively. Again, on this channel, I, I speak very bluntly and very openly because you guys want to hear it. We're here to talk about it. We're here to understand it. You know, a hardcore Christian is never going to come to a channel called Esoteric Atlanta and start watching my videos, right? They're just not because they've been programmed to believe that the word esoteric is bad, okay? Just like they've been programmed to believe that the word occult is bad. And it's not because, again, darkness can't create anything. Only the light can create. Only thing the darkness can do is steal from the light and invert. All right. So I hope that makes sense. And I hope that answers some of your questions. Um, I know people are like, show me where this says this and where this says that. And all I'm going to tell you is it comes from the missing books of the Bible and you're going to have to go on your own journey. I cannot, I, I, I come with you with my discoveries, with everything I, I, I learn and I have learned, but I can't do that for you. It is vastly important that you take the time to research for yourself. I know people say, I don't have time. Yes, you do. Yeah, you do. We make time for things that we find are important. And, and we know you know this to be true. Things that you find important, you will make time for. You just will. And so I, I just can't that this is something that you are going to have to do yourself. You're going to have to go on that journey yourself of un, of deprogramming your own belief system. If you relied on me to do that for you, then you aren't deprogramming. You're switching one leader for another leader. And I don't want to be anybody's leader. I'm a teacher. That's what I do. I'm a teacher. But a teacher's job, and for those that don't know, that's what I do off camera as well. A teacher's job is eventually to eventually not be needed. And I don't want you to need me to show you where to find these things. Nobody, when I went on the journey of reading the missing books of the Bible, yeah, I'd already had years of experience with the Vedic text in India and learning Sanskrit, and I was already very open-minded. I already did not believe that believing in Jesus got you eternal salvation because I thought that was just silly. I just, I already believed in the karmic system of evolution and, and understanding and wisdom and more of God being a loving God. And we just come back until we finally figure it out. That's, that's more of what I have believed for a very long time. But I still, in reading the missing books of the Bible, I still revered Jesus before I figured out that that wasn't his name. Um, and then when I started looking into Constantine, the Council of Nicaea, all the lies with that and breaking down King James. I did a deep dive on King James, all that kind of stuff. And when I started to do that, that's when my mind started to open up even more. And so there is a, there's an evolution here. It wasn't like I just read in one of the missing books of the Bible that Yeshua was never crucified and was like, done, that's it, I understand now. No, it was years in the making of me really contemplating and integrating and researching, deeply researching things that I should have known. You know, these are things that if I grew up in a Presbyterian church. I should have known about the Council of Nicaea. They didn't teach us about that, though, in church. They never bothered to tell us about the councils, the many, many councils where they deconstructed the Bible. Where, like, in the Council of Nicaea, they literally had editors and correctors come in to change things in the Bible. They never taught us that in church. And so sometimes I do understand that sometimes it is harder to deconstruct things that you've been grandfathered into. And for a lot of us watching right now, 
you were grandfathered into Christianity. Your parents were a part of it. Your grandparents were a part of it. It has defined your culture. It has defined a lot of what you do socially, whether you know it or not. And so it is sometimes harder to deconstruct that. That's why sometimes I think for me as someone who grew up, grew up Presbyterian, going to India, learning Sanskrit, learning to read and speak Sanskrit, going through all of the, the text with Sanskrit professors for some sometimes I notice with like my peers who are Indian or who grew up Hindu I've noticed that for me as an outsider I tend to understand sometimes what they're saying on a deeper level than people who are grandfathered into it because for me as an outsider it's interesting and it's new and so I retain it whereas when it comes a part of your culture it's so just naturally a part of your samskaric patterning that there are things that you miss and that's the same thing again with christianity if you're grandfathered into a faith sometimes it is very difficult then to go and take an academic or scholarly perspective of that fake faith to hear the truth of things like the council of nicaea you know they sainted constantine but constantine himself was a Satanist. You know, after the Council of Nicaea, when he created the Bible, the initial Bible, when he had the Council of Editors, the first big censoring campaign that happened, one of many, right after that happened, he boiled his wife alive in the town center because he thought she might be cheating on him. Then he had his son's head chopped off because he thought that his son was the one cheating with his wife. Turns out none of it was true. In my opinion, that's not somebody who had found the love of God to torture other human beings in that manner and not feel guilt or empathy. All right. And so you start to have to deconstruct the people that you've been taught to venerate as well. You know, you go through everything that happened in the council where they destroyed the teachings of reincarnation, which was a teaching that Yahshua taught. He taught reincarnation. Then you find things like the Ak Moses tablet that's been hidden away um, from public, but few scholars have looked at it and it tells the true story of Moses and it's not a pretty one, right? And so again, I just, I implore you, I don't want to spoon feed you. I will present my research, but it is vitally important that you take that opportunity to start your own journey. And if you don't know where to start, just ask God to show you. That's what literally what I do. That's what I do. I ask God to show me and lo and behold, books just start to appear in my research. I go, ah, okay, thank you, God. Here's the next book we're going to look at. Right? I, I cannot, I want to stress that to you. I cannot have you going from abiding by the teachings of your pastor who wears a black robe because a black robe symbolizes his initiation into the cult of satan that's something you can look up for yourself so you've had this person who has been lying to you intentionally lying to you and now you're going to come and ask me for the same guidance and i'm not lying to you i can tell you that with certainty i'm i'm showing you everything that i have researched there's a playlist called from the dark outpost that's where a lot of the missing books of the bible are in that playlist you can go back and you can see in the, these videos my evolution of change i haven't got any videos that you can't find that are gone were not taken down by me they were taken down by the platform okay but the, i i intentionally have left things up because I want you to see my evolution of change, my opinions changing, my aha moments, right? So with that being said, again, I don't want to be your leader. I don't want to be your leader. That's not a positive thing to be somebody's spiritual leader. I can be your teacher. I can teach you about everything that I've learned. But again, I'm going to reiterate, a teacher's job is to eventually not be needed. And I can tell you right now with full confidence, you don't even need me right now. You, you're open-minded. You want to know this information. You know how to read. You know how to research. You don't need me. Okay, you can come to my channel. We can talk about these things and I can, I can show you what I found. But I encourage you to start the journey yourself. It is vitally important that you start the research yourself. Okay?
Trust me, it is vitally important that you do this. This is part of your sovereignty. This is part of you taking your power back. Because there's going to be some things that I have learned in my research that you might not agree with. And that's okay. But you have to know if you agree with me or not by looking at the material yourself. Right? I can't have you just believing what I believe because I said it. I don't want to be a cult leader. I don't, I don't want to do that. That's, that doesn't, that's not my idea of a good life. I, I want to see you claiming your independence back. Yeah? I hope that makes sense. So, to find out if Yeshua was crucified or not, first of all, missing books of the Bible, New Testament. Second of all, look up the Mithra story. Start to look at the councils of Nicaea. All the different councils. Study King James. I have a video. I, I will, if I remember, I will put a link to the King James video down in the description box below. You can see where I show you the websites from the Freemasonry to show that he was a Freemason. And that he and the Freemasons wrote the Bible that you have today. Even if you don't have a King James Bible. Even if you've got like the NIV. That's a variation of the King James Bible. Alright, so that's a great place to start as well. To start to deconstruct. But you have to go at your own pace and you have to do it yourself. All right. Now, I did not mean to cover that for so long on this video, but obviously it needed to be said. Um, I, I have total faith in you guys. I really do. I, I want you to have faith in yourself. And if things feel overwhelming, if it gets to the point where you are overwhelmed and you are feeling your walls of reality crumbling around you because everything that you've been told is true is not true, it's all a lie, and you start to feel that panic, my advice to you is to just stop for a moment. Take a break. Shut the computer off. Go take a walk. Take a week off of research and let the information integrate for a while. Take a pause. Pausing, resting, that's all part of the process too. So if anything ever feels overwhelming, take a break for a moment. It may only might only be called for like an hour where you go outside and just walk. Or it could be like a week for you or a month where you just kind of let everything that you've researched just integrate, slowly integrate into your psyche. The one thing, the most important thing that you know is that God loves you. God has always loved you. You are not broken. There is nothing that you need to do to ensure God's love. You were born in salvation. No human being has the authority to say whether you are a bad soul or a good soul. And in the end, everything is going to be okay. So this, the story itself is just the drama anyway. So if the story is overwhelming, just focus on God. You've always had the ability to speak to God. That's never been taken from you. You've always had that ability. And so if things get overwhelming, just start there. Become like a child again. Yeshua tells us that all the time. Just become like a child again. A two-year-old. Two-year-old doesn't know how to read. Two-year-old doesn't know what the church is. But a two-year-old knows God. They don't question God. So just bring yourself back to that place. If the story gets overwhelming, if the facts and the lies, the matrix gets overwhelming, then just put it down for a minute. Because knowing the full story is not, it doesn't even matter anyway, because you're already in salvation. Already. Okay? I hope that makes sense. Anyway, I didn't mean for that to take so long. Now we're going to get into... Another installment of Akhtara, who is one of the channeled uh, channeled beings in the Octurian anthology. So we're starting on page 80, the demystification of ignorance. But before we go any further, a brief word from our sponsor. You guys know that I love a good workout. I love to sweat every single day. I work out about six days a week, at least two hours on my yoga mat, doing Ashtanga yoga or doing a bar class. When one works out, their muscles break down. I, I tell my students here in Atlanta, I've been sore for about 17 years. And as we start to age, we start to uh, have a harder time repairing those broken down muscles. Now, a few months ago, my friend Catherine Edwards 
introduced me to the product ASEA. I had been offered sponsorships before, but I had always turned them down because the integrity of the company didn't align with my own integrity. But the more I studied about ASEA, the more I studied about the owners, the person who came up with the formula for ASEA, the more I liked this company. And then I started to try the product. So what is ASEA? Again, when you work out, when you rip your muscles apart, there has to be a rebuilding system. When that rebuild happens, that is when your body technically gets stronger. We have in our body something called redox. Redox is this thing that helps, it's a signaling system between your cells. Now, when we are young, when we're kids, before we hit puberty, we have a lot of redox. That's why children are young and healthy and they can fall out of trees and skin their knees and be fine and recover quickly. But as we get older, that redox becomes less and less and less. So it doesn't really matter how healthy the cells are if the cells cannot properly communicate with each other. This means that as we get older, we start to feel more body aches. We start to get wrinkles. We start to get saggy skin. We start to get gray hair. For men, this means that the hair starts to thin and fall out. Again, it's like having a cell phone. What's the good in having an iPhone, like my iPhone, if there's no cell system to work it. The ASEA is the cellular system. Now again, I'm a pretty healthy person. I work really hard on my health, so I wasn't expecting a huge difference with the redox. However, the benefits that I've experienced over these last two months of being on ASEA have been unbelievable. I feel younger. I'm sleeping better. I feel like my quality of life is better. Even my hair, I've always had really thick hair, but now my hair is like gotten doubly thick and it's growing like crazy. I literally just got my hair cut like two weeks ago and I am about to have to make another appointment to get it cut again because it is unbelievable how fast my hair is growing since taking this redox system. My nails are growing faster. Even my boyfriend, my boyfriend who is in his early 50s is starting to thin out at the top of the hair as what, what happens to men. And even he is starting to notice his hair grow back, which is common. If you look at the uh, the stories from ASEA, so many men have grown their hair back simply by adding redox back into their body. There are countless stories of people who have lowered their blood pressure, gotten off medications, cut their medications in half because their body is being supplied with the cellular system that needs to do what the body is supposed to do and that is heal itself. Now basically what you do is when you get your redox in, you can hear it's a liquid. It's a liquid. This comes with a little shot glass, a two, a two ounce shot glass. Most people will take between four and eight ounces of ASEA a day. I take eight ounces a day because I'm obsessed with this product. So you pour two ounces into the shot glass, you swish it around your mouth for 30 to 60 seconds, and then you swallow, that's it. You can't overdose with this product. If you take too much, your body will just pee it out. Now, when you take the liquid, you're allowing the intelligence of your body to take the redox where the body needs the redox to go. I've told you guys before, I struggle heavily with it, with arthritis. And in the past, I have taken medications for my arthritis, but I do know that arthritis is caused by overthought. It's caused by anxiety. However, medication coming from my doctor only dealt with the issue of the arthritis, not the cause. But when I started taking the ASEA about three days into taking this, I noticed that I was a lot calmer. My anxiety had dissipated and I thought, how interesting is that? How interesting is that? My body knew that the source of the issue with my joints was coming from my own mind. So where did it send the redox? To my mind. There's also a topical gel that I really like. So when you take the liquid, again, you're allowing your body its own intelligence to take the redox where it is needed to help heal the body. But with the topical gel, you are able to put the gel where you want it put. I have been putting this on my legs for a while now. It has helped so much with the tightening of the skin, with cellulite, with varicose veins. It's also helped with the soreness of my legs. My legs get real sore from working out. I've been actually even putting this on my boobs you guys now again I'm 40 I've never had children so my boobs don't drop that much but I've been kind of putting it on my boobs too and I tell you 
my boyfriend really likes that so so this is a really awesome product but despite the the vanity if you have a sore leg or a sore knee or a sore neck you can put this on and direct the redox into the area that is in pain or inflamed and the redox will help with that so i even use this when i'm on my period when i get my cramps i take some of the redox and i put it topically over the area where my uterus is and it it helps my boyfriend again has been putting the gel in his hair which is helping his hair grow back right now currently if anybody knows my boyfriend he is covered in tattoos he has been getting tattoos since he was in his 20 and he right now currently is getting one of his tattoos touched up and so when he comes home tonight we're gonna experiment with the gel to see if the gel heals the wound of the tattoo even faster now we want everybody i want everybody to have the best quality of life that you can have what's the point in being a human being if you're too sick or too off balance to be able to actually enjoy your life to be actually to be able to actually work out and have fun or to go bike riding with your children or get down and play dolls with your grandchildren. This ASEA is gonna help you and help your body achieve the life that you were meant to live in happiness and peace and health and in harmony. If you would like more information on ASEA, then please text Bryce Info to 321-216-8047. Again, that's Bryce Info to 321-216-8047 if you're texting from another country please make sure you put plus one three two one two one six eighty forty seven and somebody will get back to you pretty quickly they can you can ask any questions you like of the product you can find out more information about the redox system the person on the other end of the line will walk you through every option available to you at this moment they can even try to help you get the products at wholesale prices so again knowledge is power knowledge protects and knowledge is infinite as i say all the time on this channel if you want more information please text bryce info to three two one two one one six eighty forty seven. It's kind of funny. That's kind of like very apropos for what I was just talking about the demystification of ignorance. The paradox of communicating from fifth dimensional reality to third dimensional reality is similar to a hydrogen atom, which possesses one electron comprehending potential bonds, much like a human being. Hydrogen atoms exist in their own peculiar space. That's definitely something I could definitely call humaning. It's definitely being in a peculiar space for sure. From time to time, they bond with other atomic structures to create new configurations and new possibilities. Take, for instance, the bonding of hydrogen and oxygen. Separately, these are both gases, ephemeral highly transient yet when they bond together they shift to a different state altogether which you call water it is water that characterizes the visual qualities of your planet from outer space from the perspective of space your planet is primarily blue water like human beings does not understand its, its own roots or its own configuration it simply moves or sits according to its own nature and outside forces if water had awareness like or similar to humans it might understand that it covers about two-thirds of the planet's surface this would be its reality but it would neither comprehend the fact that it owed its very creation to the haphazard bonding of two gases nor would it understand that third dimensional reality was only one possibility only those who view your planet from outer space have the possibility of understanding its orbital nature and the luminous color on its surface. Historically, we view mankind's venture into space and your first view of Earth from that perspective as the benchmark of an expanding human awareness. Something happens to the imagination of humans who, who view these photographs of Earth from outer space. The tenuous and fragile nature, as well as the exquisite beauty of Earth, become apparent to any but the most dense and intellectually ungifted individuals. This simple shift in perspective of Earth as viewed from outer space opened a doorway into greater planetary awareness. The shift is perspective. The capacity to view your planet from outer space, it's one step forward but this perspective is still confined to third dimensional reality.
The difficulty facing you as a human being is one of hypnosis due to the operations of your brain and nervous system. Literally, we were just talking about the indoctrination, right? And the hypnotism. You know, hypnosis, it's very it's actually very fascinating to study hypnosis and how programming works and, and trigger words that people will intentionally say or movements that pe people will intentionally do. There's a video floating around out there where um because we know we know 90% of the people in this community on public platforms are infiltrators. They're not here for your highest good. They're here to derail your highest good. And um, some of those happen to be tarot card readers. Now, I love I love tarot cards myself. Again, it's not about the tool. It's about the intention, the person using the tool. And there was a video floating around where someone was breaking down one of the big tarot card readers who we know for sure is an infiltrator. We know she's paid by the three-letter agency. I actually have the proof of that um, to do what she's doing, to, to um, derail and... Um, hypnotize people more and they showed the way she uses her bracelets and her nails to create a hypnotic sound to get you like to get you kind of into this like hypnotic awareness of what she's saying right and so um and it's interesting so we just got our new rules for youtube for uh, the guidelines of youtube and something in that new rules is something that she was speaking about two years ago and i was like i'll be damned she started spell casting that two years ago and getting that into the psyche and working on getting making that a reality to make it even harder for us on on these platforms. And so you that's another thing I will say, like you need to go and study like what what this mind control actually looks like and what hip, it's not just watching a finger side to side, you know, um, it's, it's not that it's it's um, it, it's there's so much involved. And so that you are aware because knowledge is power and knowledge protects, you can see these things for what they are and therefore you can protect yourself from falling into the trap of mind control. All right. So just, just something else to really start looking into. And you can find that on sec. I mean, that's where I got a lot of my information is secular studies. It doesn't have to come from like a truth or platform. Uh, you know, you can study the, the, the hypnosis and what makes the human mind go into a trance, right? It's, it's all out there. I highly encourage people looking, just Google hypnosis and uh, Google trance-like states and like how to get somebody into that. And you will learn a lot of, of what you've fallen for in the past. And once you see it, you can't unsee it, right? Once you know it, you can't unknow it. So let's read that again. The difficulty facing you as a human being is one of hypnosis due to the operations of your brain and nervous system. You believe your sensory experience of the world to be a, the totality of reality, but such is not the case. You live in a far vaster, more complex, mysterious, and odd universe than you could ever imagine. Your visual capacity is a result of evolutionary developments in your optic nerves and the visual centers of your brain. But these complex neurological structures only sense a very narrow bandwidth of the energy spectrum. Unaided, you cannot see ultraviolet light, x-rays, or gamma radiation, much less the higher spectrum that your science has not yet discovered. But because your sensory experience of the world is so vast, you believe it to be real. But whatever you sense, be it through your eyes, your ears, your feelings, your taste or touch and smell, all of these are but a small sliver of what is right before you. Earthbound intelligence. There are beings and other portions of the electromagnetic spectrum that you cannot and do not sense. Yet they walk among you move among you upon this earth we are not speaking here about aliens from outer space we will turn to those in a moment we are speaking about co-inhabitors of your planet if you train yourself to the possibility of sensing the greater universe around you you may discover the truth of what we are saying but for those of you landlocked and conditioned to the imprisonment of gravity our world must sound like a type of mythology. Your shamic traditions throughout the world are aware of these beings that exist in other portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Shamans often refer to them as spirits, but today they are simply in a different vibratory field of existence. 
To us, they are simply another form of consciousness with hopes, dreams, and aspirations much like humans. It is possible to communicate with these higher electromagnetic intelligence that live upon and inside your Earth. Some of these electromagnetic intelligence live in the higher altitudes of your atmosphere. If you make contact with an electromagnetic intelligence, realize that it may be benevolent or malevolent, and in some cases quite neutral, neither for nor against you. Some of these electromagnetic intelligence associated with Earth have limited technologies that are more advanced than yours, and some of them travel in devices that are disc-shaped, and these discs can move from higher electromagnetic spectrums into a periphery of third-dimensional time and space. In other words, you get, spot a UFO. It may be from outer space, but it could also be from Earth. Because you humans only see a small sliver of the world that is right before your eyes, you tend to believe that you are the most intelligent species. Have you seen our president? <laughs> we would contest that. We would say that in some regards, the sentients are more advanced. And there is no question in our minds that Earth's dwelling higher electromagnetic intelligence is in many cases far surpassed human intelligence. As I said, you live in a far more mysterious and odd universe than you could ever imagine. In our early exploration of Earth, prior to the emergence of the modern Homo sapiens, we encountered the planetary bound higher electromagnetic spectrum intelligences. They were here before you were as a species. In your early prehistory period, meaning that period of your history, that has not been recorded in any form you can recognize many early humans sense the presence of these higher electromagnetic intelligences. The early humans who sensed the presence of these be beings became the shamans and shamanic traditions developed around the world, each of them shaped by their geographical location. They encountered different higher electromagnetic intelligence in one area of the world than in another. From our way of viewing things, part of the difference between Samonic tradition around the world is not due solely to location, culture, and history. But some of these differences are due to the fact that the shamans in those areas encounter different higher electromagnetic intelligence. Add off-planet intelligence to this very complex situation and you have a very, very complex tapestry. As I said, some UFOs that human beings encounter are of off-planet origins, but some of them are Earth origins, and these can take the form of electromagnetic intelligence that's higher up the spectrum than you. And as odd as it may sound, some of these vessels are visitors from your future of human origins, traveling back in time for the purpose of exploration and understanding. Some of these human travelers from the future have returned in attempt to correct imbalances as they view it. This is really interesting because um, Raw from the raw material basically laughs at the ideas of spaceships. And he says, if, they say, if anybody's coming to you with a spaceship or talking about a spaceship, be weary because higher beings can just teleport themselves they don't need to travel in a spaceship and so that makes sense this is not actually an off-planet thing it's an in-planet thing or a device bringing our future selves back to our past selves to see where we can correct course correct right so i i think that's interesting and mr fox can obviously talk more about raw and laughing about the whole spaceship thing that that's a huge red flag the spaceship thing is a huge red flag according to raw um, and so it's interesting they're talking about the idea of UFOs being being more earth earthbound than anything not earth earthbound. It is our observation that most of these human visitors from your future travel in disc shaped vessels because that is the primary technology they developed. In all accuracy, I should say that you developed because these vis visitors are your future ancestors. It is a very odd situation, as hard as it may be to comprehend the possibility that future humans moving through your time in disc-shaped vessels are simply an expression of expanded consciousness. In other words, not only is your understanding of the third dimensional reality narrow and limited, but your understanding of time is confined as well. This is, again, something that Ra speaks about. 
that we don't really understand the workings of time. We live in, I can't remember if we live in time, space, or space time, but there's one we live in. And then once we go into a new density, we flip to a new reality of time, which is the actual reality of time, because nothing in reality is linear. It's all reciprocal. That's again, the Cassiopeians, the Cassiopeians, if you guys heard the Mr. Fox organic portal episode, if you didn't, I will place that down in the description box below. But the Cassiopeians are us from the future and the past speaking to us now. We're talking to ourselves. Our higher selves from the future are giving us some sort of a trajectory consciously. They're not telling us everything because we still have to make our free will choices. But it is us from the future saying, hey, look over here, right? I hope that makes sense. It's it's very hard. This is something that's very hard for us to comprehend because as they're, as they're saying, our third dimensional brain, not our, I think consciously we can understand it, but like the brain, the actual brain is designed around a third density planet. And so it's hard for our mechanical brain, the problem solving organ of the body to actually really understand something that isn't linear because all, all linear is, is an illusion anyway. All right. When a species reaches a certain developmental point, the ability to travel forward or backward in time is as simple as entering a subway car in your world. Imagine how the future humanity views its history and its ancient ancestors, meaning you, through the expanded lens, expanded lens of time flow machine. Through the expanded lens of time flow mechanics, you think that time flows in a line. But this is as limited an understanding as your senses dictate to you regarding the nature of physical reality. You live in a far more complex third dimensional existence than you can imagine. You're at a point in time where future explorers are returning to find out what went wrong. You are at the cusp in time. You are the object of much observation. To hu future humans, you are like Neanderthals. This is one level of complexity, but let us do add another layer. We are speaking here of earthbound intelligence, meaning human, future human, and higher electromagnetic intelligence. Let us now speak of the off-planet intelligence. Off-planet intelligence. It is here that I need to present a flow chart. Let us begin with three off-planet categories of being and then expand off of that. First of all, there are what you would call alien intelligence, simply because you don't understand their nature. Trust me when I say that you just seem, <laughs> trust me when I say that you seem just as alien to them. The first category, not in preference, but arbitrarily, are those aliens that possess physical vessels of travel. See, that's something Ross says is not accurate, that they're not physical. Off-worlders don't need traveling machines like we do all right and think about that like our bodies the shakti of the soul the third density body is a heavy body because we're in a heavy density but as we move up in density the shakti of the expression of the soul becomes lighter and when it becomes lighter it can materialize and rematerialize in different areas it, it, we call it teleporting yeah teleporting you think about things that we call angels the light body is able to teleport right so um so this, I again, believe would be kind of a confirmation bias from the perspective of Tom Kenyon, because I tend to really believe the raw. That makes sense to me when raw like laughs and is like, no, there are no spaceships, guys. Like that is a big red flag. There are no spaceships because off worlders don't need them because they are not in third density bodies. Like think about a rock. A rock is a heavy object. It would need something to cart it, to travel, to, to, to put it in a wheelbarrow, push it around. Think about a cloud, though. A cloud doesn't need anything. It can move on its own. It's lighter. Same thing in densities. We're in third density. A fourth or fifth density being doesn't need. It's not heavy like we are. Does that make sense? It, it makes sense to me. And so that's a red flag to me now because Ross says, like, nah, you know, don't. No. And that makes sense that the UFOs we do see are actually our own devices, our human beings coming back to check in and see like, what's going on here in the dark ages, right? Um, but not necessarily off-worlder. They don't have spaceships. Um, 
Some of these off-planet intelligence remain in third-density dimensional vessels. You would call them ships. Some have the ability to shift the molecular structures of their starship in such a way that they can move up or down from one dimension to another. But as Ross says, that's just the body anyway. That's not necessarily the ship. And in fact, we're warned, uh, I believe it's the Cassiopeians that warned us, because we do know that Project Blue Beam is looming, that it's coming. At some point, there's going to be a Project Blue Beam that's going to be done, right? Um, according to the Cassiopeians, the bad guys, the controllers of the world are, are going to do 80% of what they had planned to do. Not 100%, but 80%. And so we should probably be expecting the Project Blue Beam to unfold. Um, and so that showing a spaceship, once you understand what Ra is saying, that that's not accurate, you can kind of see through the hologram of what they're doing to try to fool you. Yeah, I know that that's not actually a spaceship, it's a hologram. Again, we know that off-worlders exist. We know that there are other species out there. We totally get that. We know that. But that's they don't travel in ships like we do. Right? They, they can teleport. We were also warned that one of the things that they're playing, the reason why they're getting you to uh, accept this idea of a spaceship is because just as they, and he's talking about how they can ship their molecular structure. So Ektara said that here, that some have the ability to, sh to ship the molecular structure of their starship in such a way. Um, Cassiopeians have warned, don't go getting on no spaceships. If you get on a spaceship, you're not, you're not getting off of it. They can shape shift into a spaceship too, and you are food. There are some off-worlders we know that we are food for them. So it's up to you. Again, knowledge protects and knowledge is power. It's up to you to understand this. So I really highly suggest, again, read the Law of One, understand what Ra is saying here. And use your common sense. Like common sense, I know it ain't so common. But common sense, a lot of what Ra says is like, oh, yeah, that's common sense. Kind of like the whole Jesus thing. Yahshua not being crucified. Yeah, kind of common sense. A higher density being does not need the same travel devices that we do in our lower densities. They can teleport. So don't be getting on no ships. If you see a UFO, as he just said, that's you. That's us. That's our future. That's time travel for humans that need that ship because our bodies are heavy. Yeah? All right. We Arcturians possess a very advanced form of technology. It allows our ships to easily move into other dimensions as needed. Again, I really am skeptical of that because of what Ross said. Our ships reside primarily in the fifth dimension, but can go to a higher dimension when needed. On very, very rare occasions, we have shifted into third dimensional reality, but it takes tremendous energy to do so and is not undertaken lightly. Um, yeah, and I, and I know Mr. Fox has said, um, and I, I obviously you guys know, I know Mr. Fox uh, very well. Um, what, he's one of the human beings that I'm the closest to in this life. Uh, and um, I trust him. He's been an incredible mentor for me in my spiritual journey. He's studied a lot of the same things that I have studied. He's somebody I can talk to about certain philosophies, and he's very well educated. He's been studying this for 30 years now. And um, he does not, even though Mr. Fox himself knows how to read the I Ching and knows how to do some divination, he's not somebody that ever really listens to any divination, except for the Cassiopeians and except for the Law of One. Because there has been years and years and years of study around this particular topic and they have proven themselves to be correct and um you know the cassiopeians say that for most channelers 99.9 percent .9 of people channeling they're talking to what they call dead dudes that's what the cassiopeians call them. they're just talking to dead dudes they think they're talking to someone's higher self or they think they're talking to god or they think they're talking to so and so but it's actually a dead dude they're talking to and these dead dudes don't know anything they're 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 just as clueless as we are because they're still stuck in the sam sark cycle just without a body that really resonates with me 99.9 percent .9 of channeling is not correct 
because they're talking to dead dudes that don't know anything, just know much, just as much as we do, right? So anyway, so I tend to, with that being said, I tend to take raw and the Cassiopeians way more seriously than anything else. I will take a Cassiopeian reading any day over a tarot card reading any day. Yeah. And that's one thing I like about the I Ching as well. And I think that's why Mr. Fox, I mean, maybe Mr. Fox could talk more about the I Ching. The I Ching is, is um, more complex form of divination. Uh, they say that Confucius kept himself alive for seven more years just so he could study the I Ching more. For those that don't know, the I Ching, you throw pennies and you get different um, hexagrams from the penny formation. And that gives you um, with changing lines. So it gives you kind of a brief overview of the energies around a situation and then what can happen if different decisions are made. That's the changing line, but it never tells you what to do. It just says, this is what could happen. And I, whenever I have a really, I'll, I'll give you guys an example. And I hope I'm not saying too much here. So as you guys know, most of you know, I have had my money stolen from my AdSense. I trusted somebody I should not have trusted with my password and my for my YouTube channel. And I forgot that it was also the same password and username for my AdSense, my Google accounts. And these people are in, in fairness, I really don't believe that the person who took the information was the one that's responsible for the theft. I, in fairness, I do, I do think he was duped. I really do. Um, doesn't mean he's not innocent because I've reached out for help. I've tried to fix this. Uh, the FBI is involved now. I have gotten the FBI. Uh, they uh, they have. I have all the bank statements. I have all the paperwork um, because it's still attached to my social security number, even though it's not coming to me. And so that can be traced. So they have all of that. Um, the military have also given four different depositions. Um, and that's how I found out that the people he's working with are actually working for the three letter agency. That's how I found out. Um, I was given all that information that these are, they, they, that the government's been watching them for a while. Um, it's just a very, it's very intense. It's a huge, it's, it's people are going to die when they find out the truth about these people. Like, holy shit. Um, there's a reason why one of them knows so much about the party drug. There's a reason why one of them knows so much about, let's just, let's just leave it at that. Anyway, when this was happening, um, I read the, I, Mr. Fox read the I Ching for me. And the I Ching said, and to sum it up, said that it's going to appear as if the bad guy is taking down the little man, me being the little man, that the bad guy is going to squash the little man, but just as the little man, just let it be. Because soon a bigger man is going to come to take down the bad guy. And I had the impression that this bigger man was somebody else. But last month, I realized who the bigger man was because I had like a three hour phone conversation with somebody else that's high up, not in the American government, but in another government um, with ties to the Commonwealth. And I was like, holy shit. This is what the I Ching was talking about. And so then I went and read the I had Mr. Fox read the I Ching on that situation. And the I Ching was like, yeah, just sit back, buttercup. It's all going to be taken care of. The goodness will prevail in the end. You know, at this point with all the crimes that I know are going on, I don't really care about my money at this point. I just want the other crimes to stop that I know are going on um, with the head of this group who now lives on an island that um, I was told by the FBI is notorious for shenanigans. So um, it's the I Ching's just amazing. The I Ching really just says like, this is what's going to happen. But if you just stay the course, it will not, it will not all be in vain. And it hasn't been in vain, you know, even though I don't get my AdSense, you know, I must be doing well because one of them just bought another house. So I must be doing well. <laughs> um, um, but, you know, I've, I've been blessed with other financial opportunities while, you know, the takedown is, is occurring. And again, it's not even knowing what's going on. It's I don't even care about my money anymore. It's it, there, there are greater crimes that are happening than money. So um, and if my situation helped expose the greater crimes, then OK, I can take that.
So anyway, I don't know if that was, that might've been a little too vague. That's all I can, I can, I can only be a little vague right now, but the I Ching is, is definitely amazing. And if you are interested in the I Ching, I would find somebody who can read it. Um, you can research yourself on how to read it, but it does take a long time to learn how to read it. It's very complex. It's not learning tarot cards is piss easy. So you can learn to read tarot cards in like an hour. I mean, it's easy. It's so easy to read tarot cards, um, but the I Ching takes years of study to be able to really understand the nuances and um, how to go move with the I Ching. So anyway, let's finish up this, um, this section. The second category of off-planet vi visitors includes the higher electromagnetic intelligence. Similar to the higher electromagnetic intelligence that are bound to the earth, these beings do not have ships or vessels. They move through space as direct electromagnetic fields, collectively, singularly, or both. They possess singular identity and can move collectively. The third category is the most peculiar one. Although to you, everything I have been discussing may seem peculiar. No, not really, Ektara. <laughs> not really peculiar to me. These off-planet intelligences are projections of the mind from a far distant civilization. Like poltergeist, like we create. That's something I want Mr. Fox to speak on more. We, Mr. Fox and I have been talking about that off camera, like the way that they create issues and then get everybody to focus on it creates its own entity, like a poltergeist. This is what a poltergeist is. It's a created entity by the emotions of a living human being. They are part of the points of energy that simply observe. They do not interact. Poltergeists do interact. They are completely to themselves and they are solely for the purpose of observing what is occurring on your planet and in your solar system. All right, guys, I was actually going to read more today, but because we got into such discussion, I think I'm going to close it down there for today. We'll start back next week with Ektara's channeling on the soul.